testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission. The season that we are currently enduring is a season unlike any in our history. If you have been like most during this time, you're ready to break quarantine and just get back to normal life again. I remember during this season a couple years ago, whenever I was much younger, going through four hurricanes within six weeks. This was back between my junior and senior year of high school. We went through Hurricane Charlie, Francis, Janine, and Ivan. Imagine being in a house with no air conditioning for what felt like weeks at a time. To say it was hot is an understatement. After the power came back on, I made a vow to myself that I would never again take air conditioning for granted. And I haven't. I hope that you can say once COVID-19 is over, that you will never again take going to church for granted. We greatly miss being around each other, and we miss just being able to be together and seeing all those smiling faces every single Sunday. One of the consequences of being confined for so long is relational conflict. The number of domestic violence cases all around the country has spiked, along with child abuse, depression, and suicides. Internal familial conflicts have arisen, and even roommates are struggling to live with one another because there's nowhere else to go and no one else to run to. How do you handle conflict? When you have an issue with another person, or even with an organization or a group of people, how do you resolve that issue? Do you ever long for peace and harmony in all of your relationships? A few weeks ago, Kevin, he asked us if we struggle with that tension, that balance between being called to love people well and also being called to share truth with them. It was encouraging to see in our YouTube live stream chat so many people who could identify with finding that balance difficult to adjust to. We're going to delve a little bit deeper into that topic this morning. We're going to take this passage that we're looking at here in Acts chapter 15, and we're going to actively apply the example of the apostles as a means by which we can learn to be reconcilers. We are not just going to look at what the apostles said in the history of this passage, but we're going to look at what the apostles did as an example for us this morning. So read with me again, Acts chapter 15, verse 1. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. My very first point is this, grace-led proclamations. Grace-led proclamations. In the early church, there was a group of Jewish believers who were trying to teach new Gentile believers what it meant to be Christians. They were teaching that salvation comes through the law and grace. They thought that following the counsels of Moses and believing in Jesus would give a person eternal life. This was a massive problem for those who are formerly Jewish as they were getting adjusted to what it meant to have Gentiles in the church. The Judaizers, as they would come to be called, were trying to proclaim the message of salvation. They were doing it all the wrong way. They were intending to get to the point of how a person comes to faith, but they were misguided and they were wrong. Paul and Barnabas got into a big debate with these people as they tried to correct their error, but the Judaizers would not be convinced. You see, the Judaizers were a traveling band of criticizers. They no doubt came to correct the error of Paul and Barnabas because they believed the apostles to be teaching the believers something that was incorrect, the incorrect way of salvation. And you're going to find in your lives that criticizers are easy to come by. There will always be people who will contradict God's message and his testimony. There will always be people who will contradict you. It probably doesn't take much thinking for you to think about people who are your criticizers. Be on the lookout for those who come to criticize those who are your opposition. Opposition is never far away, and people have no problem going out of their way to contradict, to disrupt, and to attack. The Judaizers were actively contradicting the message that was preached by the apostles. They were indeed practicing discipleship, 
they were teaching and they were trying to train these new believers, these Gentiles. It just wasn't the truth that they were giving. They were very sincere, but they were sincerely wrong. You're going to find so many people in your lives who are very well-meaning, but they're going to be giving you a false message. You see, there are going to be people that, though they're well-meaning, they're going to contradict both the word and the testimony of God. You who are in Christ have been called by God to give them the message of the truth of the gospel. Notice what God calls the early church to do in this passage. God allows them to listen to both sides of the argument, both the Judaizer side and the apostle Paul and Barnabas' side. They listen to each other as they get into this disagreement. Verse 5 and 7 shows the fact that there was a dialogue between both sides over this matter. And it's pretty amazing that the Judaizers were able to make their case in full. That's not the way that we typically handle problems. You see, when we have disagreements, what we frequently do is we block out the other person. We don't listen to their side. And the apostles are such a great example here of what it means to sit back, be quiet, and to hear the other person out. Often in churches and just in interpersonal situations, we get very impatient. The process is important. You need to allow the other person to speak even in a disagreement, even when you have a conflict. James chapter 1 verse 19 says these words, know this my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Proverbs verse 18 chapter 18 verse 13 says this, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Good listening demonstrates respect and understanding. It shows the other person that their perspective, thoughts, and opinions are valued. We see so much here in the way of good leadership by the example of Paul and Barnabas. If you're a leader, a reconciler, you could even say, never pass the buck. Take time to listen study and examine an issue, and then render a wise judgment. Leaders, reconcilers, submit to the church and other authorities. Notice how the gospel always takes precedence. Paul immediately and always reminds whomever he disagrees with of the gospel's work. The Judaizers were in effect saying, that you had to follow the law to be saved. Salvation came through law and grace from their perspective. Man is always naturally inclined to add to grace. This is the biggest issue that we face in the church at all times, throughout all of history. We always face this issue in the body of believers, this idea that we should add to grace, that we can't just believe in God alone to be saved, but there's always more that we have to do. You see, we must be careful to make sure that we proclaim salvation by grace and grace alone. God's free grace is the only means of salvation. There is nothing more we can do. There is nothing more we must do. We are only saved in and through the grace of the living God. We are saved from God, by God, through God. He is the source of of salvation. You can't pray enough. You can't go to online church enough. You can't follow the Ten Commandments closely enough. You can't be kind enough to your neighbors or even read your Bible enough. You can't do anything to earn God's grace. You see, God's favor or his pleasure only comes through what he has done on our behalf. Salvation was accomplished by Jesus Christ alone. I love what Spurgeon says when he considers this topic. He says these words, grace is the free favor of God, the undeserved bounty of the ever gracious creator against whom we have offended. The generous pardon, the infinite, spontaneous loving kindness of the God who has been provoked and angered by our sin, but who delighting in mercy 
and grieving to smite the creatures whom he has made is ever ready to pass by transgression, iniquity, and sin, and to save his people from all the evil consequences of their guilt. You see, Paul and Barnabas stood for the truth that salvation is by God's grace alone. Every day that you draw breath, you draw breath because of the grace of God. Thank God for saving you despite you. God stands ready to overlook all of your blemishes and all of your failures because of what his son has done if you truly receive him and believe on Jesus. Paul and Barnabas had this massive dispute and this massive debate. And yet what we notice is that they stood up for the truth. And you see, this isn't popular in 2020, this idea of standing up for truth. You see, we should never be afraid to defend God's word, to defend God's truth. You have to be courageous enough to stand up, even in our day. When you stand on the word of God, you stand on a firm foundation. Don't ever let go of God's truth. For the sake of harmony, you must call out sin. Promoting harmony doesn't mean that you justify wrongs. It's okay to call what's wrong, wrong. It's okay to call people to account for division that they may cause. But remember at the heart of all of that calling someone out is the grace of God. You see, anyone can receive God's grace and all of us should call one another out so that we can be led deeper into God's grace. We don't call people out for the sake of calling people out. We call them out so that they will know God better. Notice what Paul and Barnabas are debating and being assertive about. They aren't defending themselves. They are defending God. They are making a stand for the true path of salvation. They care so much for men's souls that they refuse to let the truth go. This is the same that should be true of both you and I. We should always hold tightly to the truth because we genuinely love people. 2 Timothy 2.15 says these words, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Ephesians 6.14 says these words, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Now, this doesn't mean that you have an excuse just to yell at people and just to bash people because you want to stand up for the truth. So many people take this to the extremes and they go about this the wrong way. We see that on campus. We see that in so many places and contexts in our lives. This is not an excuse to be harsh towards people for the sake of being harsh. This is a call to make sure that you always proclaim truth above all things because you want to honor God and make his testimony your testimony. Take note of how these leaders go to other leaders, what we call the Jerusalem Council. They pursue other leaders' advice on how to fix this matter. This is a great practice. When you come to difficult questions, don't be afraid to seek the advice of your brothers or sisters or other leaders. Don't be afraid to seek someone else when trying to, to reconcile other people whenever they're in a disagreement, whenever you're in a disagreement. Go to others, go to the community, go to the church, seek authorities that can speak the words of God in your life so that you can be able to honor God in that situation. It's so amazing to me that Paul and Barnabas, as they're leaving where they are to travel down to Jerusalem to get this matter resolved, they spread the gospel the entire time. They were so consumed by God's glory that even though they were in an argument, they were spreading the gospel, spreading joy, and making the entire church just well up with excitement and happiness over what God was doing with the Gentiles. And this is so different from us because we so oftentimes let things become so personal in our lives that we're not a joy to be around. 
And we don't spread God's glory whenever we're in disagreement. So we become so self-focused that we can't do what the apostles are doing. And it's so amazing to me that despite the fact that they're in this massive argument, they still took the time to spread the gospel and to bring joy to the other believers. Let's look at verse 6. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Here we see grace-led priorities. Grace-led priorities. Ten years prior, the Gentile Cornelius and his entire family were saved. And yet it seems as though at this point in time, they have forgotten that great work of salvation among the Gentiles. Jewish believers have forgotten the importance of that massive event. That was actually the content of my last message before you guys, going through that story of Peter proclaiming the gospel to Cornelius and his entire family, uh, the first Gentile converts of Peter. The fact that after all this time, 10 years, the fact that they still were trying to reconcile what it means to have Gentiles in the church is a great reminder to us. Because this tells us that we have to constantly be reminded of the truth. You see, we need to daily ingest truth just like we take in food and drink every single day. God told us that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We need to constantly ingest the Bible, constantly take in God's word. God's grace the forgiveness that we have in Christ, Christ's uh, uh, valuing of prayer that he gives us, as well as our quiet times with God, all of those are things that we should never forget. And it's so easy for us to forget about the ways of God. We get caught up in life and it just goes by the wayside. Despite great acts of God in our lives and all the great things that God has done on our behalf, we so frequently just turn aside to our own way and leave God's ways. In verse 13, there's a shift that happens. Up until this point, you have the Judaizers presenting their case. You have Paul and Barnabas presenting their case. You have Peter reminding them that God has saved a Gentile and Cornelius' his entire family, and God has been continually saving the Gentiles. And then in verse 13, you see the apostle James stand up. And that's a really pivotal part in this story. You see, when James stood up, I can imagine the hearts of the Pharisee believers soared. Here was the blood brother of the Savior, the half-brother of Jesus. This is not James, the apostle John's brother. This is not him. He died in Acts chapter 12, verse 2. But this is James, the half-brother of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul, he tells us about James' conversion in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, whenever James had a personal interview with Christ after he was resurrected. This is the writer of the book that bears his name. He was called James the Just by the early church, and he was an exceedingly faithful and devout Jew. You see, the whole of his life was given over to God. He was exceedingly prayerful, so much so that he had calluses on his very knees, they discovered whenever they looked at his body decades after he died. He was severe, and he was ascetic, and he was a pillar of the early church. When James opened up his mouth to speak, undoubtedly, these, these Jewish believers, their hearts soared, and they were so excited because he was their guy. If there was ever a person among this group of people at the Jerusalem Council who was going to defend their cause, it was going to be James, the person who was an extremely devout Jew. He was their person to defend their cause. Surely he was side with them. But when James spoke, he began by showing that the conversion of the Gentiles was prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures. Read verse 13 with me again. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. 
And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. James's example of going back to Scripture is a great reminder of what God has called each and every one of us to do. He was a reconciler. James was uniting the church. Let's look at some things that we see in James's life and his words as we consider this idea of conflict resolution. The first thing we see James do is we see James speak of the gospel, the salvation that God has provided. Always begin with the gospel whenever you have a disagreement with someone else. Start by offering hope in God's forgiveness of our sins in Christ. All of us stand in need of God's forgiving love. All of us need to give that same love to others. Jesus' completed work on the cross should motivate and infuse every single conflict that we go through every single disagreement that we have with another person. We see James give the gospel, but we also see him speaking the truth in love. There are some immensely practical things that we can see here from this text whenever we're trying to resolve conflict, and I just want to go through a couple of those things with you this morning. When people wrong us, we must respond with love when giving the truth. 1 Peter 3, 9 says these words, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you are called that you may obtain a blessing. Luke 6, 27 through 28. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. 1 Corinthians 4, 12 through 13. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. And finally, Romans 12, verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Implied in blessing someone is loving them. Even those with whom you disagree, even those with whom you feel as though they are against you, we're always called to love. Another thing we see is that James encourages us to be gentle at all times. You see, it's okay to be firm, but only be firm when gentleness has been persistently rejected. Gentleness lowers a person's defensiveness and antagonism. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Next, talk to others from beside them, not from above. All stand equally at the foot of the cross, we each have an ongoing need for the Savior. So identify with those and relate with those who disagree with you on the points that you can agree on, like wrestling with our own individual sins and weaknesses. It's so easy for us to, to talk down to people when we disagree with them, but that's not what God has called us to do. He's always called us to come alongside the other person and never to speak down to them. Communicate so clearly that you cannot be misunderstood. Don't communicate in a way that can leave the door open to varying interpretations, but think carefully about your words. Rephrase and clarify as necessary so that nothing comes across as vague or imprecise or misleading. Communication is such an essential piece in conflict resolution. Use the Bible carefully. Your intent should never be to tear others down, but always to build them up with the scriptures. 
You should always make sure that you're using the verses in context whenever you're trying to encourage someone to do this or that. And finally, as you consider using the Bible carefully, your goal should be for the other person to read the scripture for themselves and to come to their own conclusion about what the text is saying. Don't try to impose your interpretation of what the Bible is saying, but give them the word. Let them process through it so that they can have the truth of God applied to their hearts as they try to understand what that text is communicating. These are some really practical ways that you can resolve interpersonal conflict. So practice one or two of these over the next couple weeks. The next thing we see James do when he's trying to resolve this dispute between Paul and Barnabas and the Judaizers is we see that he addresses both parties in his response. As he's considered both sides, he's heard all the arguments, he's heard everything that they thought about why salvation should have been accompanied with uh, works of the law, and from Paul's perspective, why salvation shouldn't be accompanied with anything. God's free grace is enough. He heard both sides, and that's really powerful for us this morning. You see, he starts with the Jewish believers, and he addresses them, and he says that they are to, to lay off the Gentiles. They are already in the fold. These Gentiles are. They're already God's sheep. And so because of that, just lay off of them, James says. Nothing more needs to be done to get them into the fold. They are fully in God's grace. And so we see right here that James is addressing both the Jews and the Gentiles. He's addressing both of these different groups of Christians, and he's calling them to be united, to come together. James was a reconciler. Let's look at our final point as we look at verses 19 through 21. Our final point is this, grace-led privileges. Read verses 19 through 21 with me again. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. James established the importance of doctrine and of teaching by emphasizing grace. But now he turns his attention to fellowship. Now his focus is on community. Believing correctly is vital, but so too is community. James knew that if the idea of grace was taken too far, these Gentiles would have invited the Jewish brothers over for pork chops, and that would have massively wounded the conscience of the Jews. You see, these converted Jews would have had a hard time having dinner with a Gentile where whenever they're going to be eating pork chops in that home, and so fellowship had to be restored. Fellowship between these two groups was nearly impossible if the barriers weren't lowered and if they weren't able to resolve the conflict between them. And so what we see James encourage them to do is never to flaunt their freedoms. You see, here we see that just because you're free to do something doesn't mean that you should always practice that practice before all different types of people. You see, let's take drinking alcohol for an, as an example. Many groups of Christians believe that drinking alcohol is perfectly fine. And many groups of Christians believe that drinking alcohol is morally wrong. If you're in the presence of a person who believes that drinking alcohol is morally wrong, even if you believe that you have good scriptural reasons for why it's right, you shouldn't drink with those people. You shouldn't drink around those people. You see, our freedoms are never to come before community. We're always to lower our freedoms, give up our liberties for the sake of our brothers. In this text, James offers three prohibitions to the Gentile Christians in verse 20. He says, first, stay away from everything that has to do with idolatry. This was the first and second commandment wrapped up in one. This was a, a first and second commandment issue for these Christians. A very high number of meat markets were attached to temples where idols were worshipped. And so it will be easy for an unbelieving Jew or an unbelieving Gentile to see a, a Gentile Christian 
go and get meat from this temple, go and get meat from this market that was attached to, um, to idolatry, and for them to believe that that Christian was still worshiping those idols and still worshiping those false gods. And so James encourages them just to completely avoid anything polluted by idols so that they would never have that contradiction being seen by those on the outside. He also encourages them, number two, secondly, to abstain from promiscuous sex. You see, this was one of the biggest sins of the Roman world with all types of Gentiles is that they had very little understanding of restraint. They had very little understanding of of what it meant to be abstinent. And so the worship of idols and even normal civil life was accompanied by sexual sin. And so James says, Gentile Christians, if you're going to promote harmony, if you're going to give up your freedoms for the sake of your brothers, make sure that you are staying away from uh, this, this sexual sin that is rampant around you. And then the third thing James encourages them to do is not to eat anything that has blood in it. You see, this was something that was very clearly outlined in the Old Testament law, is that you have to drain the blood fully from an item before you ate it. And so this would not be a very difficult thing for the Jewish Christians to do uh, on behalf of their brothers and sisters um, as they come into relationship and community with them. This would be very easy for the Gentiles to, to give up eating meat with blood in it for the sake of their Jewish believing brothers. You may ask, why does James put these restrictions on these Gentile Christians? Why does he do this in the first place? The answer is in verse 21, where James in effect says this, Don't practice these things because your Jewish brothers who are present in all the Gentile cities will be offended by them. If you're going to win them over, make sure that you don't practice those things that they disagree with. This is a really great example of what Paul encourages us to do in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 12 through 13. Paul says these words, Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Don't cause another person anguish by the things that you eat or by the things that you do. Even if those things aren't black and white, even if those things are not morally wrong one way or another, give up those freedoms for the sake of your brother. The Judaizers added all of these non-biblical standards to salvation. They added law uh, law living, uh, added living by the law, living with the law, making sure that you followed the law to the process of salvation. That's an encouragement to us not to make non-biblical standards the standard by which we judge and evaluate our brothers. And, and this is so natural. It's so natural for us to push our preferences on others It's so natural for us to say, well, good Christians do this or that whenever Scripture hasn't said to do this or that. I'll give you some examples. There's no Christian dress code. There is no one type of Christian music. There isn't one Christian denomination. There's not one Christian political party. If you smoke as a Christian, that is perfectly fine, and you are not more mature as a Christian if you drink. None of those non-biblical standards are things that we should make the standard by which we approve or disapprove of our brothers. Those things are not black and white, biblically clear issues that we should draw a line in the sand about and cease fellowship with others about. For those things, those gray issues, those things that aren't morally right or wrong, we should compromise and we should do the best that we can do to love our fellow brothers and sisters well. Love comes before preferences. Value community above any freedoms that you have. We can sum up all of this that we've discussed this morning, all of these these conflict resolution principles with a couple things. And let's walk through them right now. When we want to promote good conflict resolution, first, communicate in a respectful way. Second, understand the personal issues that motivate the person that you're in conflict with. Third, 
Submit to your authorities, be they church, civil, or otherwise. Fourth, earnestly seek to understand the other person. Fifth, look out for the interests of the person you're in conflict with. Sixth, address others' slights, prejudices, insults, mistakes, and violations in a gracious way. Seventh, don't back people into a corner, but rather develop solutions that are consistent with their values and with their principles and beliefs. And finally, eighth, when someone is gracious or even makes a credible point, make sure that you praise them and you thank them. You see, James listed just a few restrictions out of love for these Gentile Christians to do in light of their Jewish brothers. The Gentile Christians in verse 31, they rejoiced when they got this letter from the Jerusalem council. They were happy to make concessions for the sake of their Jewish brothers and sisters. They're they're believing Jewish brothers and sisters. And so my final question to you this morning is, how do you handle conflict? Do you give up your freedoms to bring others to Christ? Do you fight for your rights? Or do you give up your rights so that others can know the Savior? Do you assert yourself? Or do you seek wisdom from leaders, lean on Scripture, and put other people's needs before your own? As you bring things to a close, I want you to just remember a couple things. Remember to live and proclaim grace. Salvation is for all people. Forgiveness is available to everyone. Faith in Christ plus nothing equals salvation. Only the grace of God saves. If you believe in grace, you can't add anything else to it. So lead a grace-filled life. Everyone who has received grace should give it. Pray with me right now. Please take the next few moments to ask the Lord to lead you to practice the word that you have heard today. The world should come to us because they see how we interact with others, the way in which we love people, the way in which we allow the grace of God that has transformed us to lead us to be gracious to others in return. They should come to us and just marvel at what it means to live and be a Christian. Ask God to lead you into his truth, to seek his wisdom, and to be gracious. God, we thank you this morning for this word that you have given us. God, I thank you for the challenge in Scripture to always make sure that we both understand the grace of God, receive the grace of God, and then give that grace to others. God, I thank you that you led the apostles to be men of grace who showed us truly what it means to come into fellowship with others. God, help us not to be selfish. God, help us to always seek what's best for the other person. Help us to love others well so that we can always honor you with our lives, so that we can show you how much we love you and how much we love others. God, let your grace lead us to be gracious. We ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A testimony to God's faithfulness to his mission, which is to see the God in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in newness of life.